Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the Center for Art in Woods monthly object lesson event. Um, object lesson is held almost every first Friday um, and it opens wide the cases of the Center's museum collection through the perspectives of individuals from the worlds of art, design, performance, education, and much, much more. The idea is to create fresh dialogues around the collection um, and its objects and open the treasury wide to the community at large. Uh, we hope that it offers an up close and personal experience um, in a salon style setting, which will encourage exploration of the many, many wonderful objects in our permanent collection. Uh, before we get started, I just ask you to join me in acknowledging the Leni Lenape who lived in harmony with one another on this territory for thousands of years before being removed um, and sent to the west and the north of this country, um, while also remaining among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. Um, if you would like to know more about um, this tribal nation, um, please uh, take a look at the link that Katie is setting up in the chat and um, learn how you can advocate for um, their recognition in the Commonwealth. Okay, so for Object Lesson October, Rachel Salbrick is joining us and it's such a pleasure to have her with us. Rachel has a demonstrated commitment to creating inclusive spaces in the arts over a career that is focused on building public and private partnerships in ways that leverage support for the advancement of artists. Rachel joined Contemporary Craft in Pittsburgh on the other side of this Commonwealth in 2021 as executive director, and she's responsible for leading the organization towards their strategic goals in their new permanent facility. And if you haven't visited, you really, really should. It's gorgeous and really conducive to um, some deep uh, engagement with art. Previously, Rachel served as the arts and culture manager for Allegheny County Airport, authority on the arts, culture, and history specialist for the city of Pittsburgh, and was also co-founder of Curated PGH, a retail gallery that focused on fine art and functional craft. Rachel sits on the Art Advisory Committee for the Sports and Exhibition Authority and is member of both the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh Print Group. She has a master's in public administration from Gannon University and a bachelor of fine arts from Edinburgh University. And I just feel like I should also mention that um, Contemporary Craft hosted the exhibition Searching for Home, uh, work by Humaira Abid, which was here at the center in 2020. Um, and it's that, that is how we first met. Uh, when I went over to see the show and installation at Contemporary Craft. So it is such a pleasure to have Rachel um, with us today. And with that, I'm handing it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And yes, that, that was an incredibly powerful exhibition. We were really um, honored to be able to host that as well. Um, so Hello everyone, I am Rachel and I just want to first and foremost say thank you to the Center for inviting me to be with you this evening. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm happy to be sharing this space with you all um, virtually or hybrid, however we're meeting one another uh, today. Uh, Last weekend, I had the opportunity to actually come over to the center in person, which was an incredible treat. I really enjoyed the current residency exhibition that is showing in the gallery, which um, it just is kind of happenstance that a piece that I've selected that we're going to talk about this evening was made in an earlier residency. So it was a really nice correlation that uh, I appreciated uh, seeing that that current work. I also just want to say if you're you know, there in person or you visit uh, virtual and not there and have the opportunity to visit the center, I think um, the object lesson is amazing, but the permanent collection that you all have is just absolutely, truly incredible and inspiring. Ever since I've come back, I've really been thinking about the, the objects that we have in house here at Contemporary Craft and the history and lineage that exists with those and how we might be able to activate them in the present day. So 
to, to Katie and Nava, you know, thank you for the collegiality and the time and sharing this, this um, collection with myself and everyone else. This is really, really rich um, wealth of, of objects for us all. So um, on to the object that I've selected for us all to talk about this evening. It's a piece by artist Julia Harrison. And she's just someone whose work I absolutely um, deeply admire. The piece in the collection at the Center for Art and Wood happens to be a door, and the door has a hand-carved element. So I'm looking forward to introducing you to the piece, and um, I'm going to see if I can share my screen again. And Katie, will you just let me know if anything is awry? It looks good. Okay. All right. So let me just switch over here. Um, so before we start really focusing on the work, I wanted to take a few moments to um, talk a little bit about Julia and her, her artist practice and who she is. So uh, the thing that I appreciate most about Julia, I think, um, and that draws me to her work and her process is her spirit of observation. She is one of those artists that is just absolutely acutely aware of the references that are within her work and what she is drawing from around her uh, during the process of making. And I think, you know, for me in my career and as an artist, I'm most often and most deeply moved by people whose work really shows um, their relationship with materials. And I think Julia Harrison is one of those artists, again, that like you can't look at the work and not see her relationship with the material of wood. Um, it's just so intimate and accurate uh, that you can see the time and the understanding of, of her affinity for the material. Uh, so yeah, that work continually shows me that, co that connection throughout, whether it's the jewelry, the sculptural, et cetera. So I actually met Julia uh, years ago whenever I was running the education department here prior at Contemporary Craft. And she had taught a workshop for us. And the title of that has never escaped me. You know, when you do programs for years, everything has a title and it, it comes and goes. But this has stuck with me for maybe seven years now. Um, the title of that workshop was called Jewelry That Grows on Trees. And uh, the whole description was just so compelling enough that I actually also took that workshop myself. And I enjoyed it because we started with found wood that we then ourselves carved down to shapes and forms that we found interesting. And of course that was like carving, sanding, carving, sanding. Uh, and we were learning how to inlay metal within that work. So then you would drill a small hole use um, like a metal wire, put it down into the hole, cut it off with some pliers and sand that down again um, and, you know, carve again, sand again, and then ultimately wax and have a beautiful piece of jewelry. And I myself am a printmaker and I work most often from wood blocks, even though I do uh, abstract mono prints, I still print from wood blocks. And so I would have to say that in the craft field, I'm probably most fluent with metals and ceramics. And this was my first kind of entree to looking at wood as a material outside of the printmaking realm. So Julia's really, she was my introduction to let's study this material. Let's see what it can do, what its tenacity is, what its like acceptance is. Um, and it might be why the light went off for me when I was looking through the collection at the Center for Art and Wood and I, I stumbled upon Julia's work and I was like, oh, this is where I kind of fell in love with wood as a material. So uh, Julia has a BA, uh, an MA, and then an MFA from the University of Washington, just to give you a, a bit about her academic background. And um, I imagine that most people, if you know Julia Harrison or you, you hear the name and you think about the work, you might most likely be familiar um, in the association with a series of these carved mouth brooches. Again, jewelry is a favorite of mine. So I, again, I think that's where Julia's work resonates with me. But 
these pieces also have um, correlation to the door that we're going to talk about this evening. So these carved mouth brooches uh, were also part of a prior conversation that I had with Julia, where I was really trying to get to know her, her practice and her work. And I asked her, um, how do you feel that everybody knows you by this work? And she said, in a in many ways, it's a blessing and a curse because it's so recognizable that when people see this, it's like, oh, that's Julia Harrison's work. But at the same time, uh, she's making this work in grad school. And I believe that was around 2003. So, you know, we're a little bit far away from 2003 now. And so that's where I think for her, she's saying that um, it would be nice for people to see the other work as well. But what's really nice about this work is that uh, I think it pulled together a lot of different things for her. It served as a way of learning. She told me that by creating these different mouths over and over and over again, she was learning really about the economy of expression and how to not overdo it, finding out what details are important, how to pay attention to those details, how to read emotion really through a piece of wood. And I think, again, if you know this work or you see this work, you can absolutely begin to recognize the emotion that comes through. So when I watched a video of Julia from the residency at the Center for Art and Wood, she was talking about her time living in Japan as well and not knowing the language and how the mouth served as an observational tool to kind of understand and recognize what people were saying or trying to convey. So she, she speaks about the mouth series from the perspective of wanting to leave something to the imagination for the viewer um, and that they also leave, I guess, you know, the opportunity for people to find something within it for themselves beyond what she might be trying to say. So in part, I find it particularly interesting due to the intimacy of this work, both the brooches and the door, uh, because in practice, you, you know, in carving something like this, you're essentially becoming one with the piece. But arguably, every one of these brooches is about a, a different woman or a different person modeled from life or maybe not necessarily literally modeled from life. Um, but yet, as an artist, Julia has taken on such an in-depth relationship with these pieces in order to convey the personality and life within each of them. Um, this is just another image of an earlier work, uh, a different type of material, but same type of process. So... Be, beyond the images of the mouthpieces and jewelry, I think, you know, a transition to a larger discussion about Julia and her work is really her practice and the carving practice. So she works reductively or subtractively. Uh, and in prior conversation had conveyed to me that it's really a core part of who she is as a person. And that it's something that she does at least a little bit every day. So Julia also serves as an arts administrator. She's working a little bit in the public art realm. She's in another residency at the moment, but no matter what she's doing and what she's exploring, she's carving. And again, I, I think I choose her work because she's so aware of, of the reference. So again, this is a series of images that Julia has taken and, you know, compiled that leads into this other work that she's made, which is a, a series of work about generosity in the hand of giving. And I think, again, I just look at this and I, um, I really enjoy the direct correlation between the rep reference and observation to the work. And it reminds me of another series of work that Julia had done uh, that were hand knockers. And I don't have any images, I'm sorry, in the slide deck, but if you uh, look at her website, they, there will be some under, I think it's the, the shop or the jewelry section. And what I like about that work similar to this is that those were made from a series of photographs that Julia had taken over a series, I think she said of five years. Uh, and portion of that during time in Mexico where she was working and then at home. Um, and so she started just collecting all this imagery and, you know, again, for me, it's seeing that observation continuing and as an undercurrent over and over again for years. And having just finished an exhibition here at Contemporary Craft called Food Justice, um, that's when I first noticed the, the door knocker work that Julia makes. 
and those pieces were really about how in in Japanese culture there's um a blessing uh, that essentially translates to I receive, or it's an acknowledgement of all of the stages that, that something has gone through before it reaches your table. And so the knockers that Julia is making have carved fruit that sit within the hand um, so that you're essentially giving or receiving that component. So everything that comes to bear again through that reference is really, I think, what draws me to her work. So I think this is, you know, a good time to come to what is the piece in the collection, which is this beautiful door that you all have. Uh, it was created in 2015 during the International Turning Exchange Residency. I think I got that right. And Katie or Nava, I invite you, if I get any of this part incorrect, please correct me. Um, but the residency, I think, started in 1995. Um, it was founded, I believe, by the, the co-founding director of the center. Um, and it was um, a program that essentially uh, existed to bring artists from all over the world to Philadelphia to be in community with one another to explore the materiality of wood. And if I'm correct, maybe there's a photojournalist that is involved in that process and documents the artist practice and making. And uh, so this is a chance for artists to really experiment with what it is to work in wood. Maybe they already have that as their practice or they're trying to bring it more into their practice. Or for instance, I think Julia um, during this residency was really trying to test and experiment things. I saw a video where she's working with a chainsaw or, or doing things outside of the carving practice. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the current show, um, it's on view, I think, until October 20, 23rd, something. Please get there if you haven't seen it yet, um, is the current iteration of this, this residency program. So when Julia was part of the residency, um, ultimately she did come back to the process of carving uh, and created this wood, which or this door, which is made out of basswood, uh, gouache, and urethane. And I'm gonna just talk a little bit more about why I selected this piece because I watched Katie Sorensen's object lesson as I was saying before we got started. And I loved the personal connection that you drew to the pieces that you selected and why. So for me, as I mentioned, I am a printmaker. Um, and, you know, outside of my administrative life when I have, when I have time. Um, I've been actually working collaboratively with my wife for about seven years now, uh, and she's a metalsmith and she works larger than I do. So it's challenged me to think about my process a little differently than I normally would. And I actually myself started carving from doors because I was trying to make prints that were about three foot by three foot. And I needed a much larger, you know, canvas to work from. And it turned out that doors just you know, naturally gave me the size that I was looking for. So it was interesting to me that here I am as in my practice trying to deconstruct doors, take them, you know, just chisel away at them in order to make um, a wood block. And then when I stumbled upon Julia's work, it was like the opposite of here is somebody actually trying to, you know, add to a door. Now she's not actually applying, she's literally still carving. Um, but it's instead of using the wood to serve as a tool, she was using the wood to become the, the aesthetic element of the door or jewelry for a building as she called it. Um, so what you're looking at here is of course me carving the wood and then in the center, it's actually threaded through some steel and laid onto steel, stitched into place and then had sculptural components on top of it or um, has the wood set in with magnets. So if we talk a little bit more specifically about Julia's practice, um, again, carving is the primary part of her practice. 
And I wanted to kind of look at and focus on this image that was taken during the residency for a moment. So this is Julia approaching a piece of wood uh, with a carving tool. And I'm not sure how clearly you can see the screen, but I wanted to try to share with you. Um, this isn't like a spot for flex cut tools or anything, but um, these are the types of tools that essentially Julia is using in this image. So FlexCut, I've used a lot of tools. FlexCut is amazing because it, it comes with a handle and you can kind of like change your gouges in and out. Um, they're incredibly sharp. You can go from like the soft woods, the hard woods. And if you're not familiar with carving, the way that these work is that each of these essentially has um, different shape to it. So there's like a U gouge or a V gouge and it, it allows you to carve um, your lines very differently. So you can come at something and get a very tight, um, clean, crisp carve, or you can get more of like a, a U uh, or a gradation depending on your tool. So um, certainly going from this to the next stage is, as I was joking before about jewelry, lots and lots of sanding, carving, sanding, going back and forth again and again. So, um, this is a great tool. It'll add a lot of fun to your life and make things a lot, a lot easier for you. Uh, and so the types of wood that you can think about for carving, as I mentioned, the door is actually basswood. Uh, basswood or lime wood, it's, it's relatively soft, but even with that softness, you can get really nice crisp edges. And it's great for if you're using hand tools or carving. Um, personally, I also like cherry because it, it has like a nice uniform grain that again retains details whenever you're you're going over and over it again popular for similar reasons so just a little bit about the different types of wood uh, so the door itself being made from five thick basswood boards uh, Julia mentioned that she felt it was very important that the mouth be an integral uh, part of the mass of the door and it, that it wasn't just an applied sculptural component. So she planed and sanded the surfaces, but left the center board a little bit wider or, or you know, having some more depth to it and then planed down the, the exterior areas, I guess I would say, and then left where the mouth was going to be. And then she actually carved the mouth down into that plane. Um, and she talked to me about how most of the work she had to actually be sitting on the door in order to be able to reach the area where the carving was. And even though she's been at this for an incredibly long time as an intricate fantastic, you know, um, Carver, she mentioned, I think the center, I don't know if it's in your collection or not, I know as part of the exhibition I saw in the, the images, um, she had done a number of test carves prior to carving the door. I don't, do you have those or do they stay with her? Maybe. Okay. Um, so uh, she says that this door was by far the largest thing that she's ever made. And she gave a lot of credit uh, when I asked her about this project to the to the center for the residencies, because for, for an artist, a residency really opens up the world to opportunity to be focused, to kind of be dedicated and maintain diligence on your practice, but also to explore and examine things that you otherwise might not have the opportunity to do in your daily practice. Um, she gave a lot of credit to what was then the shop technician, Jay Cox, because she said, again, for a project of this size, she really needed the support to, to learn something that she hadn't done previously and to literally have um, an extra set of hands when coming and putting that, that together and laminating the boards. So you know, just like any other door, for the most part, the way it was made was, as I mentioned, planing those those boards down, gluing them up, laminating them together, um, and then doing the carving. Uh, these were some really fun images that I was able to get a hold of. So uh, I asked her a little bit about what this work was or what it was representative of. Uh, and she said that while the mouth doesn't really look like her and it wasn't really meant 
to be literally her, that it was based on screenshots that she had taken of herself during the residency while she was FaceTiming with her partner. So again, I think for me, I found it just kind of interesting that, as I mentioned in my own practice, coming at working with a door was because of work that I was doing with my partner. I really thought it was kind of like the icing on the cake that this work also had some kind of correlation to her own um, relationships and um, personalities. So as I mentioned, she carved a series of tests before getting really to the door. Uh, and she wanted the expression to ultimately look like it was welcoming and engaging. And that would invite viewers to, to come to it much like the brooches with their own story or their own experiences or their own expressions. And then beyond the door, uh, something that I just think is a little bit fun is to talk about where is Julia now. And Julia is currently at Penland serving as a resident. And she's working um, still in carving, but doing some of these larger scale public art installations. The one that's in this image right here is um, for a community center that will be installed. So all of the components are kind of coming together there. So um, that's kind of where I, where I'm at in terms of what I have to share, but I just wanted to open it up if anyone else had some thoughts or questions, or if you from the center had any insight that you wanted to share about this, this piece. Thanks, Rachel. That is so, um, that's such a great view of this object that I get to see. It's a privilege to be able to see and interact with this object every single day that I come into the center because it's now the functional door of the office in which I sit. Um, thanks to Albert who um, had the vision to install it. <laughs> um, so um, I didn't know some of that some of those insights. So this is really, really wonderful. Um, I should mention that um, last year we had an exhibition, and I think Katie put a link in the chat, um, which focused on um, contemporary jewelry um, and the use of wood and woodworking techniques, um, and, um, and examined the way that wood can be worn on the body, and then the phenomenon of what happens um, when you scale wood to the size of the body, the human body, and, um, and engage with it on a tactile um, level like that um, directly. And, um, and Julia's work um, was featured in that exhibition and it was a series, her cleavage pendants, which oh, yeah. in a really loving way. Um, and I think that's that's the um, softness of, of her carving and the sensitivity of it. It really does um, reflect flesh. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I'm reminded of um, medieval, um carving in your divinity carving in europe um which which that wood was the material of choice um for for those objects and um remind i think she she kind of spans time in her work um yeah. by by remaking those references um but also choosing a a very specific part of a woman's body <laughs> to to which is fetishized anyway in our contemporary culture and to select that as the focus of the actual pendant or the gem, um, which is traditionally an object of, of value, um, was a really smart move on her part, very clever work. Um, and I think that's the kind of artist she is. She's very, um, she immerses herself in her research um, it's not enough for her to adopt Japanese carving practices. She has to go repeatedly to Japan to study with Japanese carvers. Um, and um, I'm very, very lucky to work with her. Yes, I agree. She, she is an absolutely phenomenal artist and, and colleague. Um, I'd like to open it up to people with us. Um, either on site at the center or um, visiting us through Zoom to um, just 
open up and ask Rachel any questions if you like. If you're shy, it's also okay to put your questions in the chat. Well, I have a question for you, Rachel. Um, how you mentioned, you know, some some a workshop which um, has a really beautiful title, and I will not forget that. I might use it in the future, but um, beyond beyond the sort of immediate ways of engagement during that you experienced during the workshop, how have you taken Julia's um, your your interactions with her and your experiences with her forward in your own work? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think it causes, it has caused me to pause and spend much more time with things, especially working um, abstractly. It's easy to sometimes just move without a lot of thought about those movements and so it has definitely taught me to at times to stop and sit with with the wood specifically and kind of see like how is it feeling and what is it what is the possibility of it and think a little bit more about what the next carve should be um, rather than just going so what felt intuitively before um now I think maybe feels a little more rushed and I, I try to think a bit more before making those marks. Yeah, great question, thank you. <laughs> great answer, thank you. I just wanted to um, mention that I um, have had a long conversations with Julia uh, about her practice and the meditative-ness um that carving um, allows and that it is extremely therapeutic, especially at, at this day and age that we're in. Um, we saw a lot of spoon carvers and, and whatnot, but um, the repetitive motion of the hands and the connection with the material um, can bring so much peace um, to the individual that, that's, that's in the process of making. Yeah, and I think it's interesting too about her work, um, Nava, you know, you alluded to this about the pendants or the cleavage series, but just so often when you think about, at least me, when I have previously thought about what it's such a tough material when you originally kind of think about or approach it, and it has a tenacity to it, and it, it can take a lot, it can weather a lot, um, but there's just something so organic I mean, obviously, as a material, it's organic, right? But um, the way that Julia approaches it and leaves that finished object feels so organic. It just feels full of life. Um, and it feels as though it, it maintains a soul of some sort beyond just being an object. That's really nicely said. Um, I love when you mentioned the, that she kind of, her work represents a correlation between the reference and the form of the object itself. Could you talk a little bit more or unpack a little bit about that for us? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it is just that, you know, so often people are making things and, you know, they have a proclivity to, to making a certain thing or making it again and again, or, um, they, they enter the act of making with the destination already in mind. But I think that from what I can pull with Julia's work, she often seems to approach the act of making with an intentionality or with a desire. But as the process goes, she allows that step, like each of those steps to bring her to the end result. Um, and there's some fluidity to that. And it seems apparent to me that, that the allowance of that often goes back to the initial reference. So it's like, this is in my mind. I'm really truly trying to convey something or feel something or be at one with something in a way. But I allow myself to move differently to get to the end result um, as an honor of that original intention versus just like, I want to make this thing and I'm, I'm going 
you know, I don't, there's not an aggression about making the thing. There's a, there's more of a passion about conveying the intentionality. I haven't, I haven't considered this before, but does she have a, a sort of a, something that she goes through before she starts carving or sort of directly engaging in a process? It's a great question. I'm not sure. Well, oh, Meryl, please. Yeah, I have a question. I was thinking about the door with a mouse in it. The amount of work to make the door and prep it and plan to have a section raised so that you can put the mouth in, that, that takes a lot of pre-thinking. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just sort of mind-boggling in a way. Um, yeah, yeah, when I oh go ahead. No, yeah. by all means, go ahead. When I first started here at the center, um, I I mean I walk in here and that's the first thing I see, right? But um I had to stop and think that through, Meryl. And I think that's a really good observation is that she, you know, as intuitive as she lets herself be in her work, um, there is a lot of deliberation. Mm -hmm. yeah especially that piece maybe not I I sort of remember seeing the mouse somewhere were they in American Craft Magazine I mean they they made an impression yeah um because I I didn't connect it with her name but the door is a whole different kind of thing I, I, I love it I do too it's definitely next level <laughs> <laughs> and it's a must see when you come to the center well and it's interesting too you know I guess I hadn't really thought about it but the the brooch like when you wear it on your chest or wherever you choose to wear that object of jewelry is very much different than when you're situated um at, you know more at an eye level or or mouth level it's much more of an an experience that you have with that from one end to the other, much like a person on the other side. It would be interesting to know how she went from the brooches to that. You know, that that's a big leap. Right, because most of her work is scaled to be worn on the body. Mm -hmm. um, even if she's um, creating objects, and, um, and this is something that she um, presented in um, the Wood Biennial at Bellevue Arts Museum when I was working there was a series of, um, this was a quite a departure for her. Um, she stopped focusing on the body and created a, a suite of um, objects that were miniature, slightly miniaturized, maybe 50% scale, but they were things like there was a trophy and a, and um, like a first okay. place ribbon yeah. and um, yeah, yeah. And, and um, there were these codes with the objects, right? And, um, and they had their own presence, but, but it was, um, I, I think I see her getting an inspiration and then, and then just going for it, um, even if it represents a kind of thematic or con conceptual departure from, from her usual body centric work. It's really, I, I, it's really nice. I really like it. I'm glad I came tonight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did too, Meryl. Thank so you. good to see you. Well, thank you so much for having me this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with you all. Thank you, um, Rachel, for shedding some light on this very beloved piece in the collection. Absolutely. And I hope to see you very soon. Definitely. I will be back for a visit. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And um, if you find yourselves in Pittsburgh, please stop by Contemporary Craft and um, say hello to Rachel and um, view the exhibitions, participate in the programming and buy things in the store. It's a great organization. Yes. And please. <laughs> in the meantime, you can see um, 
2022 residency show here in the gallery until um, the end of October. And we'd love to see you here too. And you can buy stuff in our store also. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone. So good to see you and um, be safe and enjoy the weather if it's as nice as it is here in Philly, where you are. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, Meryl. <laughs>